Okay, welcome back everybody. We're moving on to Chaos 2. So we're going to finish up Chaos today. And it's section 13.3, subtitle Topological Transitivity and Mixing, and then Dense Periodic Points. And really those two are separated into subsections. Uh, mixing is not something that is necessary for Chaos. It's not something that I technically needed to, to uh, cover in this section, but it's something that's really important to a lot of dynamics and dynamics problems, so I wanted to cover it anyway. And it's really closely re related to topological transitivity, so that's why I've included it in here as well. And uh, and dense periodic points is, of course, our, our, our last part to chaos if we're following Devaney's definition. So topological transitivity and or mixing, what we want to think about, at least with, with mixing, we want to think about the distribution and dissolution of a drink powder into water. I think everybody would say that, you know, if, if I take some lemonade powder and mix it into my water, that that's a mixing process. And what it means to mix is to eventually evenly distribute the powder. Uh, mixing is, in some sense, mixing is this idea of starting with a collection of points grouped together. And then they spread evenly and, and never come back together. Mixing is kind of like this, this unidirectional process. You can, you can go in the forest direction, but it's really hard to come in the reverse direction where you start with a collection of points grouped together and then under the dynamics, they get spread apart and they're never gonna come back together. You're never gonna get even two of them uh, you know, close together in some sense, in some well-defined sense. Topological transitivity is actually what we require for chaos though, and this is weaker. It's a weaker assumption than mixing. But we're gonna introduce it here. Topological transitivity, you know, if we start with our generic dynamics, which we've been working with for you know, the entire part of the book now, uh, we're going to call it topologically transitive if I consider the flow map, right? Recall the flow map is basically just saying I'm reinterpreting the initial condition as an X, and then that's the input to my flow map, and then its output is is uh, Y, whatever Y ends up being at that specific time. So if that flow map decides to take some set or some region, ball, I guess I'm calling it here. So if it grabs a ball, omega 1, and then a second ball, omega 2, and it brings them together. That's what this is saying. In some sense, it moves at least one point from ball one, which is omega one, into ball two, which is omega two, at some future time. So as long as there's some future time for which it grabs at least one point from the first ball and puts it inside of the second ball. That's topological transitivity. And there's no bigger or lesser requirement on it than that. It's just that it grabs one point from any ball we choose. But the important thing is that it's any, right? So any ball we choose, I can grab some point in there. I don't need, I don't need a specific point in that ball, but there needs to be at least one point in that ball for which if I flow, I eventually end up in any other ball that I choose. So for example, if I'm just sitting in maybe two-dimensional space, two-dimensional balls are circles, by the way, there's ball one, there's ball two, omega two, omega one. And these had to be arbitrary. And it says there's some point, and maybe the dynamics flows this point like this, does something crazy, but oh, there it went through ball two. And so eventually, at least one point in ball one ends up in ball two. And this needs to be true for a different ball that I choose. Maybe I chose a ball omega three here, and it doesn't have to be the same point, but now a new point comes by and does something like this and it flows and it eventually goes through omega three. And so I need that first ball to eventually, for some point to eventually make its way through any other ball I choose. That's what topological transitivity is. So that's what the remark states. It's just reinforcing that idea of some point eventually making it there. Um, I want to mention that our next example is using a non-autonomous dynamics. And that's because actually in dimensions one and two, we require some non-autonomous dynamics to get behaviors that that mimic mimic what we're actually trying to define. Actually, these, these definitions work for the non-autonomous dynamics, but but you really need three dimensions or higher to get these sorts of nice properties of topological transitivity and mixing and dense periodic points um, for non-autonomous systems. So for some of these these uh, these examples in this section, you have to be okay with the non-autonomous systems, even though understandably it's not it's not quite as pure as like the autonomous systems for these dynamics. But it gives us an excuse to to just get these down into one dimension. And so if I, I consider the following non-autonomous dynamics, y prime is t inverse minus tangent of t times y. So this is actually linear non-autonomous. And I initialize at my point x. This is actually topologically transitive on Rd. And so let's think about what it would mean to be topologically transitive on Rd. That means that if I take my number line r, well, this is just on r, 
Um, if I take my number line R and I initialize some point on the number line, that's X, and I run these dynamics on X, then the path that X takes through R, whatever path it takes, it eventually needs to make its way through all of R. That's what it would mean to be topologically transitive here. So I need the path of X to be all of R eventually, right? So the idea is that if I choose something else in R that I eventually run into it in the dynamics. Okay, let's see. Let's see why this might be the case. Well, you can verify it mathematically and I'll jump up to that in a bit, but here are, here's a plot. This is as time moves to the right. So that's T. And then this is the value of Y of T. Okay, to the left, right? And so if you zoom in right there and you look at the beginning, I've, I've initialized this at like, I don't know, I guess I've initialized it at six different points all around zero. And we can see that the spread of these six points, no matter where I'm where I'm going over time, it's eventually reaching everything, right? So I'm passing through more and more of R every time I oscillate. And this is actually true for every single one of those points. Um, and so I'm definitely topologically transitive. If we wanted to prove this mathematically, we go ahead and solve the, for the flow, right? So there's my flow. It looks like X divided by pi T cosine T. And if I want to, I want to prove that this flow, no matter what ball I start this flow in, I end up here and at any other point. And the important thing is since balls have positive radius, there's always a non-zero X in the ball. Right, because in fact, zero is a fixed point of this dynamics. You'll notice that if I plug, if I start at zero, then I stay at zero for all times. But, but thankfully, there's at least one non-zero x in any given ball, which means that um, we can verify it by choosing any point in our initial in our initial region that's non-zero, and then setting t one to be kind of the 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 floor function on x naught over x, and then t two to be the ceiling function on x naught over x, and then we've got some plus or minus pi's just to make sure that at t one I actually recover this number, whatever that number is, and at t two I recover this number, whatever that number is, um, and you multiply by pi because that's sending these cosines to plus or minus one. Okay, so that means that these two points I've reached uh, at least two other points, and then actually x zero has to be between those two points, and by by the intermediate value theorem, I, I know I have to pass through x zero at some point in between. You could technically solve this exactly for what, at whatever x zero should be, but uh, that's a lot of a lot of effort, and so I, I did, decided not to do that. But that's a proof of topological transitivity for a non-autonomous system, and this is kind of how you should think about it: is that it's eventually running into everything, the trajectory. And mixing is just like a stronger version of this. So if I'm topologically mixing, we actually have different notions of mixing in mathematics, and a lot of the other ones require graduate level math, like in particular, the topology of Euclidean space for the most part, um, slash measure theory. And so this is just to topological mixing is kind of the simplest one to introduce to all of you. And that's, it's a stronger property that's stronger in the sense, it's specifically stronger in the sense, stronger that once at, least one point from the first ball is in the second ball, then there, there's always a point from the first ball in the second ball. Okay, so this is stronger than, than topologically transitive because if we jump back maybe to the two-dimensional setting and I have my first ball here, omega one, I have my second ball here, omega two, and I find my point which starts here, x, and travels its crazy trajectory. We don't know what trajectory it's traveling, but it's crazy. It eventually ends up in omega two. Then I don't necessarily require that x always ends up in omega two, but I require that there's at least something from omega one inside of omega two at all future times. So that specific one, the first one that got in there doesn't necessarily always have to be the one that's inside of there, but something from my initial ball always has to be inside of there. So I have to, I have to guarantee that, okay, if the first one's eventually gonna leave, something else has shown up by then to stay around. So then this, this makes a lot of sense when we think back to, to mixing a lemonade mix into our drink is that if, if I eventually spread everything out, any region of that lemonade mix should have, you know, or the lemonade drink should have lemonade mix in it at some point in time. There should never be a point in time at which all of the drink mix has left any given point in the, in the lemonade mix, so, or in the lemonade drink. So, so it's mixed once every point in space has something from the original ball uh, spread through it. That's what it would mean to be mixing.
Okay, so now I have the next example where I'm approaching the same exact non-autonomous dynamics I had before, which was topologically transitive, but in fact, this one is not mixing, right? This one's not topologically mixing. And that's because if I jump back up here, once I reach, let's look at a good example. Once I reach, use uh, purple. Once I reach, let's say this point in space right here, that's a point in space that I've reached. You'll notice that no matter where I start actually at this point, all of my initial ball is at zero. So the, the entire omega one, my initial ball is at zero here. And hence it left the region omega two, right? If like, if that's my region omega two or something at this time, future time, it, it entered it here, but then it left it there. And there's nothing, there's nothing in the region omega two at that time. And actually for infinitely many times, there's nothing in omega two. So this is a topologically transitive dynamics, but it's not a mixing dynamics. For us to have something that's mixing, we consider something that's really, really contrived because I'm sticking myself in two dimensions for all of you. You have to, like I said, you have to jump up to three dimensions and you start to get some really, really complicated situations to describe mixing. You can imagine, you know, if I were able to mathematically describe the dissolution of that lemonade mix into a lemonade drink, I would be a very powerful mathematician. And, and of course, potentially I can do that, but it's not the sort of thing I would want to introduce to all of you because it's not easy to, to visualize, understand, even write down, right? We're talking about fluid dynamics at that point and, and things get pretty crazy. So this is a very contrived two-dimensional dynamics uh, and it's a flow map I've just defined here. So there's my X, it's a vector in two dimensions. I've put an X there and I'm taking powers of this particular matrix and I'm taking them modulo one, okay? So more or less this is saying only look at the numbers after the decimal point, right? So the numbers before the decimal point don't matter. It's the numbers after the decimal point that I care about. And then these signs here only exist here to interpolate. This is really a discrete dynamics that's uh, that's kind of hiding inside of uh, continuous dynamics because I've decided to put a T there. And so what's actually happening is I've got a little bit of an interpolation of, of a discrete dynamics. But anyway, this is topologically mixing. I'm not going to prove that. Um, but what you can look into if you care about this being topologically mixing is Arnold's cat map. So this is a map that was originally described with a picture of a cat. That's why they call it Arnold's cat map. Um, and it talks about how you can how you can mix a two dimensional system. So if we look at this over basically the the the, the first nine first nine integer times, we take some clusters of initial points and the clusters, these are really, really closely clustered to those five initial points. And you can see that over time, these points are really spreading very, very far apart, right? You know, after at time four, they look, they look okay, right? You, you can tell that they started out as five clusters at time five, you'd be pretty hard pressed. You know, you, you kind of see more red over here, more blue over here, green in that region, orange -ish in that region, purple is pretty darn spread out there. And, you know, by time six, you just can't, you just can't even tell that you started with five clusters. So six, seven, eight, nine, at all of those times, everything is perfectly spread out. Those particles have mixed basically as much as you're ever going to see them mix. A, a better way of maybe thinking about what's actually happening with the dynamics here, and I think something that you can probably start to, to recognize, is that if you were to cut this out with a piece of paper, maybe make it a very rubbery sheet of paper, and you glue this end to this end, you're going to get a cylinder and then go ahead and glue this end to this end. So what would happen if you took a cylinder and connected the other two ends together, you would get a donut, right? So you're going to end up with a, with a donut looking thing here, or maybe you, you glued it right there, you glued it right there. And then technically you also glued it all the way along this middle line and then the outer line as well. So you've glued it together, you get a donut. And actually what we're observing here is the dynamics of a flow over, over the surface of a donut or a torus as, as mathematicians would say. So that's what you can think about. That's why you kind of see this like weird periodic action happening here. So glue those together. Um, and then and the same here, right? Glue them together. And it actually looks like a single flow and it's going to be flowing over this torus and you eventually perfectly mix. Uh, you, you can probably start to believe me that it's it's never none of these colors are ever going to separate out. They're never going to make their way back to a nice cluster or something like this. So that's a good example of a mixing map. And that's the first subsection here. We're moving on to the last section of, of chaos. So recall in this subsection that I didn't actually need mixing. I don't need this this crazy process of mixing, even though that this one probably is chaotic. Um, I don't need that process of mixing. Uh, to be chaotic, all I need is this 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 process of topologically transitive. So something a little bit weaker than mixing uh, is the second point that I need for chaos. I need that sensitive sensitivity to initial conditions. And then the final part is this idea of dense periodic points. And so we'll talk about what it means for a point to be periodic. 
We're going to start with our classic dynamics, and then we're going to say that y sub star, okay, so y to the you know, superstar was my equilibrium point. I'm using a sub star here to talk about a periodic point. And a point is periodic if it satisfies the property being equal to that point at some point in time. So at some time t, I'm equal to my point. That implies there's a later time t plus capital T sub y star. So some later time for which I actually end up where I started, right? That's that's our idea of periods, right? A lot of anything that we call periodic, it leaves something, but it eventually comes back, right? If, if, uh, if the clock pendulum is periodic, it leaves, you know, at the far right point, but it eventually swings back to the far right point, and eventually swings back to the far right point, and eventually swings back to the far right point. And that's what it would be to be periodic in these situations, is we just have this with underneath the dynamics. There's some points in that space for which, you know, I leave, I'm doing something, blah, 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 but eventually I come back. And this right here, you can start to see this is why two dimensions prevents chaos, at least uh, in a non-autonomous system, because so long as I have one periodic point, then everything inside of this period, right, my period traces out a path, everything inside of my path is restricted. And so there's not really a way for me to be sensitive to initial conditions, because the most I could possibly move around is, is whatever the size of that path is. And um, um, I couldn't really be topologically transitive for anything inside of here either because I, I can never leave. Now, you know, potentially you could argue, okay, maybe you have like chaos inside of that specific region, but but there are some other proofs to kind of say that that's not going to be true either. So this is why two dimensions prevents chaos is because we, you know, we need these periodic points to be chaotic and yet in two dimensions, period, periodic points kind of portions off the space. So then I'm stuck, you know, I have like, I have like region one outside of the period and then region two inside the period. In fact, if I'm, if I'm dense, and we'll get to the idea of dense, then actually the entire space has to be filled with these, um, these paths that connect on themselves. And, and so we're really not going to be chaotic in those situations. Uh, but you can imagine in three dimensions, all right, if I do a good job adding to my drawing here, in three dimensions, you know, I'm, I have some path that I take and I'm periodic, but then I can grab another point in here and it passes over at some point, but then it passes under at another point. And I can have yet another one over here, maybe, that passes over there and under there and over there and under and under and over or something. And, you know, we can still gain periodic uh, orbits. These orbits can still exist, um, but we're not restricted to any regions, right? So that the one dimensional path that they curve out is not restricting us to a single region of space in, in dimensions higher than two. Uh, the time, capital T, which is my future time by the time I get back to where I started, that's called the period. And I guess I should probably mention this is, of course, the minimal time, right? Because twice the period is still a period, three times the period is a period, and so on. So the minimal time for which I come back to where I've started is the period. So here's a great example of, once again, a non-chaotic system, which is still going to exhibit the property, of, one of the properties of chaos. You'll recall I had my linear system of dropping the orange on the upside-down bowl that exhibited sensitivity to initial conditions. I have the linear system up here, which is unfortunately not um, not autonomous, which exhibited the second property of chaos being topologically transitive. And now I'm going to come up with a linear system that is autonomous, that, that exhibits uh, periodic points, and in fact, dense periodic points. And this is going to be the Hamiltonian dynamics, right? So we're going to recall that the, the orbits, or really the, the trajectories, of this dynamics, dynamics, were this uh, this plot of a bunch of circles orbiting the origin, right? So the trajectories, if I started here, I orbit the origin and I end up there. If I start here, I orbit the origin and I end up there. If I start out here, I orbit the origin and I end up there. And so I have a bunch of periodic points, right? This entire space is actually filled up with periodic points, uh, but none of them none of them are really exhibiting like topological transitivity or, or, um, or sensitivity to initial conditions, right? Because we determined this was actually a stable system. So this is a, a good example of a, of a system with a lot of periodic points in it. And I have a remark that I'm saying, in some sense, we can consider a lot of points as periodic, but this is maybe a bad, a bad approach to take. But you're sometimes allowed to say, okay, fine, let the period take on the values both zero and infinity, then actually a period of zero is an equilibrium point because I, I infinitely quickly come back to where I started. And then a period of infinity is really like a, a not periodic point, right? It takes me forever to come back to where I started, uh, which in some sense is that I've never done it. Anyway, the, the next definition is what it would mean to be uh, to have dense periodic points, right? And so this is actually our third condition for chaos. It's stronger than just that periodic points exist, but rather that they're dense. And this idea of dense is a tricky one in mathematics. I, I was a little loath to include it in this book because it's something you should take real analysis for. Um, but well, I think we're able to handle it. Okay, so a point, a collection of points, and I'm calling them S. Okay, so this is my collection of points S. Um, think about it 
just like a set. Like I'm just like extracting points um, from, from this other set, omega. Okay, so I'm grabbing a collection of these points inside of omega, which itself is inside of RD, but that's some region or some ball in RD. And it's called dense in there. We use the word dense. If for any ball that I choose in the original space that I'm looking for, there's at least one S in that ball. So maybe I'll, I'll plot this out maybe in two dimensions. I grab uh, some collection of points S in two dimensions. So I'm just extracting all of these points here in two dimensions, and maybe I call those S. And if I grab any ball, this is like omega one. If I grab any ball, then I have to find at least one point in that ball. And what do you know? Here's a ball, and I found a point S in that ball. Now the real question is, is this collection of points which I've drawn dense in, in R2? So is S dense in R2? The answer is no, the current one I've drawn, because what is my what is a good example? Here's a ball. Call that one omega two. That's a ball, certainly in R R2, but there's no points of S in there, right? There's no there's no way that I could find any point of S inside of that ball. And so what you start to notice really quick is that in an infinite space, dense sets, we all call dense, yeah, dense collections of points. must also be infinite. Okay, and so a good example of this is the rational numbers. And if you call recall what the rational numbers are, these are the, this is the set of numbers P divided by Q, where P and Q are integers. That is an infinite set. It's not all of R, but it is dense in R. Because no matter what interval or ball, a one dimensional ball is just an open interval. No matter what interval I grab in R, I can find a rational number inside of that interval. Right? My, I mean, my ball has to have positive radius, but we're always working with balls of positive radius here. And so that's a nice example of a dense set. It just means I can grab, I can grab a, a point in any ball. There's a, there's a point in my dense set that's no matter what ball I originally chose. Um, and so a dense set of periodic points means that within some region omega a subset of RD in my d-dimensional space, then I actually, if I consider the set S where it's just all periodic points within that region, omega, so I'm looking at all of the periodic points of this dynamics inside of omega, that has to be dense in omega, which, you know, in this setting, that means there are definitely infinitely many. So we must have infinitely many periodic points. And in some sense, they must be evenly spread. Evenly spread through omega. Okay, so if I'm calling myself with dense periodic points in omega, I need infinitely many of those and they have to be evenly spread. And then, then I can basically say that I'm dense in omega. And that's the third, the third property that I required out of a chaotic system. Um, so you can think about the sensitivity to initial conditions, you can think about the topological transitivity, you can think about uh, dense periodic points. So I need this interplay of like everything is super sensitive to its neighbors, I need everything to eventually reach anything else, right? So that's a, that's a topological transitivity, it eventually has to get pushed somewhere else. Um, and finally, it, I have to have, it eventually has to, each point has to eventually come back, and not each point, but like infinitely many of these points, which are evenly spaced, all have to loop back on themselves. And so you, you, you can imagine throwing all those, those three properties together gives you some pretty crazy systems. Um, let's look at this Hamiltonian dynamics again. That's a, a nice example of the one which actually has dense periodic points because if I plot these trajectories again, you'll recall what they looked like. I had a bunch of circles around zero and uh, each of these circles was periodic. Um, but in fact, every, every point, right? Every point in R2 is periodic. Right, every point in R2 is periodic here because um, these periods, these orbits map map everything. And so if everything is periodic, then certainly I have a dense set because I have an infinitely many evenly spread set. Um, and then we're gonna end this chapter on, on one example, maybe the classical example of something that exhibits chaos. And this is the Lorenz strange attractor. And I've had you all working with this Lorenz system for a while now, ever since we started on nonlinear systems. Um, but, but now we're actually gonna see kind of what it looks like. And we're going to see it specifically for, for sigma, that's the first parameter there, equals 10, rho equals 28 is the second parameter, and beta equals 8 third is the third parameter. And there's a specific region called the Lorenz strange attractor for which this uh, dynamics is chaotic. Okay, and I'm just going to scroll down a little bit and we'll look at what that region looks like. So what I've done here is I've used Runge-Kutta methods. You can't solve this in closed form, so you have to use some sort of approximation method. So I've used our, our RK4 approximation scheme from the last chapter.
and and I uh, simulated this for three initial conditions pretty close to each other. Okay, so in the grand scheme of things, negative or one negative one one, one negative one two, and two negative one one. These are all very similar initial conditions. In fact, on the screen you can see where they started; they're all right there. So they're very close to each other in the grand scheme of things. And then you can see them just get drawn through this strange attractor, which is which is known as the Lorentz strange attractor. So. Um, and then the trajectories kind of behave what I'm tracing out on the screen for you right now. So they kind of go through, they kind of get stuck in here for a short while, but eventually they make their way out of there. They could sometimes get stuck over here for a little while, make their way out of there and come back. And so this kind of has a butterfly looking shape. And a lot of people like to say that this is the butterfly effect. It's not, it's, it's Lorenz's uh, paper about, does a butterfly flapping its wings cause a tornado? Uh, I guess flapping its wings in the Atlantic cause a tornado to form in Texas or something like that. Um, that, that, that paper, which inspired the name, the butterfly effect actually didn't have too much to do with his system here. Uh, it's just kind of a nice coincidence that this one does look like a butterfly as well. So people will call this the butterfly attractor sometimes. Uh, but this is just a nice example. So you can think about basically this region. If you, if you take, now it's going to look a little bit heart shaped. If you consider that region and call that Omega, you basically say the system is chaotic, uh, in Omega. Okay, so it's chaotic in that region. In fact, it's not chaotic in other regions because if I started, if I initialized somewhere like out here, it actually decides to come into here and then start tracing out this path. Okay, so this is an attractor. It is as a whole an attracting set. And so two points out here would eventually come close together, but once they get in the set, within the set itself, they, they behave chaotically. And so that's something to keep in mind about chaos is you don't need it over the whole of space. You can restrict yourself to a lot of, in a lot of situations, these strange attractors, and that's where you'll see uh, chaos. And so that's the definition of a strange attractor. I don't stress it too much, but what you can think about is that uh, an attractor is just a region, which is attracting and, you know, go back to section 13.1 to talk about points, which are attracting. You can talk about, you know, the distance between a point and its, and its initial an equilibrium point and an initial point and see if those get closer together. You can also talk about the, the distance between kind of an equilibrium set and an initial point and whether or not that initial point gets drawn toward the set. That's kind of the, the notion of an attractor is if, is if an, an initial point gets drawn toward a set over time. And then if that set happens to be chaotic, right, if you have some sort of chaos within the set itself, that's when we call it a strange attractor. Strange because it behaves chaotically. But anyway, that's that's chaos for you. So you've got your chapter on chaos. Uh, it's not something that I experienced as an undergraduate, and I was a little sad that I never did. So I'm really glad I can bring it to you all. I'll see you in class. Bye.